Hi, this is Sarah Lacey backstage at TechCrunch Disrupt with Keith Ravoy of Square, COO. And we cleared up on stage, you actually are the COO, you're not the acting CEO, mm -hmm. while Jack goes over and fulfills his issues with, with Twitter? Nope, nothing's changed at all. We have the same exact roles. Um, Jack's CEO, Jack will always be CEO of Square. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, that's more than he could have said for Twitter, so a uh, very different story. All right, so um, we talked about on stage how, um, how Square is tracking better than PayPal was at this point and the metrics that, that you right. used and people can you know kind of look back to the post if they want those details. I'm curious how much of that is simply the maturity of the web and a billion people being online and people being comfortable. I mean you guys had to blaze a serious trail with PayPal and how much of it is something this team did better from an execution point of view? Well I think first of all Square's mostly about offline transactions so we're enabling face-to-face -face transactions like right now if we were selling something. You were Square, bribing me to Square, ask questions. Exactly. Square I'll pay you 50 dollars if you only ask softball questions. I should, <laughs> actually, I really should try that with I Mike. Know. It's, it. the bully. it's like you have these really good ideas later. But anyway, so some of that is a function, but we're mostly in the real world. So that's one thing that's different. I think also just we've learned PayPal made several mistakes, uh -huh. right? Like it took us you know, a long time to figure out fraud. It took us a long time to figure out some other things. Did a lot of things that were great as well. Right. But so hopefully we've learned from some the last 10 years, some of that knowledge has you know, disseminated throughout the valley and some of it can be repackaged and used to not make the same mistakes. Right. I've had a lot of discussions with the different members of the PayPal Mafia about, about a lot of things, I'm but, sure. about, <laughs> but about particularly whether or not um, selling PayPal was the right thing to do. And I think almost every person has said ultimately on balance it was because yep. it was so dependent on eBay. There were very real problems in terms of frauds and, and states yep. suing PayPal. And you know, as Peter says, like one of the reasons you guys all stayed friend is, is because you had this great outcome and you look back. <laughs> That's true you know, too. There was, it, was a, it was a contentious it was. place to work. Absolutely. Um, which you would expect with Peter and, and Max starting a company and, and Elon in the mix as well. Um, but, so I'm, but so I'm curious, like, are there ways that you're building Square so that the answer to that question doesn't mean, doesn't turn into, yes, we had to sell because of all these issues, um, you know, but this could be the big standalone payment company. Sure, so I think it was the right thing to sell. I was a champion at the time of selling. Um, I think, you know, we lost a lot of sleep at night and Reed had this great expression of, just because someone shoots a gun at you five times and misses, doesn't mean that the sixth bullet doesn't land. And so there's a little bit of that that went into, went into the calculation. Um, David Sachs wrote a great answer on Quora. I wrote one as well on why did PayPal decide to sell. It's actually a really thoughtful answer by David. So I, um, yeah, so we are not derivative with one company. We get all of our users from a wide swath of places. There's no single source of our adoption, mm -hmm. and that's really powerful. Like, so we had a huge eBay dependency. We used to say publicly that it was 70% on eBay transactions, but in fact it was closer to 90%, meaning that a lot of users who used us off of eBay actually found out about us right. through eBay, so we were heavily concentrated on eBay. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really have another path of growing to that scale. Like There was not an adjacent market that we could find in a short enough period of time that offset some of that risk. So I think it was a pretty rational decision, but at Square we're doing everything to be a standalone company of consequence for a very long period of time. Uh -huh. Now you, you and Mike talked about fees <laughs> on stage. Um, I mean, the issue that's pissed everyone off who loved PayPal in the early days is that eBay is just used as an engine to charge more and more and more fees. As you know, someone who put you know lifeblood into building that company, do you think that was a mistake? I don't know if it's a mistake. I worry more about the, the destruction of the brand. So the brand itself, it used to, as you remember, have like a certain amount of sex appeal and there's a lot of movement and power behind the brand. In fact, one of the reasons why I believe Meg Whitman decided finally to buy PayPal was she saw that at eBay Live, all of the eBay power sellers were actually wearing PayPal t-shirts right. instead of the eBay ones that they had right. handed out. So I think the brand was really resonating, but the, feet, the product has become very bloated. Mm -hmm. David pioneered um, an idea that he doesn't get a lot of credit for. He actually really invested in design back in 2000, which was very unusual. We had a huge design team, probably about 10, 12 people, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, at that time was considered incredible. And over time, they've just layered more and more and more features. So the product is very, very bloated, very, very difficult to use. And I think, I, w I worry more about that. So like, for yeah. example, when people know that I used to work at PayPal, they look at the product, they're like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, and it's I feel somewhat like embarrassing it's actually. Up now who like didn't have that sort of like, didn't get the initial 10, $20, yep. you know, from using it and telling your friends, like, they kind of missed what was cool about PayPal. Uh, absolutely, like I, I think there's definitely a generation gap. And I mean, I, I remember doing some consulting for a company in 2007 and the product people there asked me like, 
why would you be proud of this PayPal thing? I know, I know. Um, okay, so I want to talk about how easy it is to start a company in Silicon Valley now. It's, it's something I've been hearing a frustration from from a lot of entrepreneurs that people are just that people are just um, you know instead of if it, basically if it's a guy like you who should be an operations guy. Right. Instead, because it's so easy and there's so much glamour, he's starting a company. And so, like, that guy is not going to be the operations guy for some hot up-and-coming company. And yep. as we all know, a single entrepreneur can't do it alone. I think you're such an interesting role model for kids coming to Silicon Valley because, um, because you know, you've never been the founder. And you said on stage, I'm not a product visionary. And yet, you've been, you know, one of the core management guys building PayPal, building LinkedIn, building Slide, and now building Square for huge companies. So, I guess, what would be your advice to people coming out of college about how, you know, should they roll the dice on a startup or should they look at their skills a little more? So, I, I think the hard part about starting a company is it's actually pretty easy, like these days, to start a company, raise, I don't know, 500000 to a million and a half dollars. That's the, actually the easy part. The hard part is getting the user's attention and building a critical density of talent. So, the reason why people talk about the PayPal team is there's a fair number of people, like probably 25 to 30 people that were just exceptional, mm -hmm. all within 254 people in Mountain View. Mm -hmm. And so, that critical density of talent is what allows for exceptional outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you're one of the thousand companies that start with four to seven people, there's very limited chance to break through and break through with user attention because users still only have 24 hours in a day. So if you launch a new product, you have to interrupt something and replace something that they're already doing, whether it's family, friends, you right. know, church, or other websites. Right. Or working out and playing software. Yeah, no, you've got to substitute somewhere. There's just no way to extend the day. And so people forget that. Second thing is though, also, to build a company of consequence, you need hundreds to thousands of people. And where are you gonna get these people from? And how talented are they gonna be? Unless you hit escape velocity, there's almost no chance that you can assemble that incredible array of talent. Mm -hmm. And I actually had this hypothesis a couple, several years ago that um, Ohm actually wrote about, barring from a, a comment Roloff made, that one of the reasons why we have these boom and bust cycles in the Valley is that in the times of uh, bust, it's easy to assemble uh -huh. a critical density of talent. Like 85% yeah. of the people we offered jobs to at PayPal accepted them because right. there was no other jobs. Uh -huh. Same thing Google from 2003 to 2005 must have had an you know, incredible acceptance rate. So they were able to you know, assemble that talent and keep them all in one place, in one building or a set of buildings for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Today, it'd be very, very difficult to get that group of talented people together. That's like producing the movie that I was referring to with Mike. You need an incredible range of people to produce an awesome movie. Uh -huh. You know, from the from the people behind the scenes to the people in front of, you know, the producer, the director, the people in front of the camera, all of that has to come together to create one of these companies. Right. And so if there's two minutes fragmentation, it actually leads to a suboptimal number of successful companies. Uh -huh. So that that's what I always tell entrepreneurs is, are you sure, you know, how are you gonna go from four or seven people that you know already to having hundreds of people, and why are you going to be the one company that yeah. everybody joins? Well, it's, like, it's like we've solved the capitalization yes. issue. We've solved how easy it is to get a product out. We've solved you know, access to capital, but you still haven't solved that you need all these people to build a company, well, it's like, and that's what I think people miss. Yeah, it's like Major League Baseball. There's only so many, Major League Baseball could not expand to twice the number of teams because there's not enough Major League baseball level caliber pitchers, right. like particularly left hand, you know, left hand pitchers, there just aren't that many in the world that are that good. Yeah. And so you can't create an infinite number of companies because there's not an infinite number of A plus people. Mm -hmm. That's probably tech crunch has. Yeah. There's only so many brilliant tech journalists. They're, that, exactly, <laughs> that's why they're, they're all in tech crunch. <laughs> all right, last question. Peter Thiel, uh, your good friend, announced um, his finalists for his 20 under 20. Um, there's, but this has been a huge fight at TechCrunch. <laughs> I, I think it's an awesome program. I think kids all have their own path. I don't yep. get worked up about someone stopping out of school for a couple years, and I think it's only 20 kids. And people say, well, what, you know, you're pregnant. What if your kid did? I'd be like, my kid went to go work for Peter Thiel for two years? I would be like, right on. Yeah, but exactly. there's people who think this is morally wrong. I, I, I think Peter's more right than wrong. Um, I think most, so there, it's like, it, it, Continuing my sports metaphor for a second, there are people who are prepared to drop out of high school or finish high school and go right to the NBA. Mm -hmm. Most people are not. Actually, most people aren't qualified to go in the NBA, period. Yeah. But it's still better for most people to go to college. But if you're that level, that dedicated, that smart, there's no reason to be herded you know, in a sort of classroom. Like Paul Graham, his first book, uh, Painters and Hacker, Hackers and Painters, has this point about high school is mostly designed to sort of force people and like babysit them. Right. And so. I think Peter's tapping into that. A lot of the best people you saw Ron and Ron Conway and uh, David present on stage, a lot of the best entrepreneurs are pretty young in their career. Yep. So getting a jump start in that, if you are one of those people, when I first started at Square, actually interesting, half of our sort of um, 
leadership meeting the first day I was there were people who dropped out of school. Really? Yep. Wow. And I, I made up for one of them because I have two degrees. <laughs> so, but uh, I was actually... So you can only make up for two. <laughs> I don't need any more degrees, definitely. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap up. Thank you again for uh, flying out. I know it's a busy uh, week for you guys at Square, but th thanks we love for inviting me. You. Thanks very much.